Five Tricks to Eliminate Procrastination and Maintain Focus Getting what you want out of life often comes down to something very simple, sustained effort. Will Smith says that what sets him apart from the competition is his willingness to stay on the treadmill until he collapses. He will go the extra mile. You hear similar stories in every other industry and among every other highly successful and driven individual. You want to win. You need to put in the work. And that means you can't be getting distracted. So in this presentation, let's explore five quick tricks you can use to procrastinate less. 1. Do the fun task first. Many of us think the first task of the day should be the biggest and the hardest. With that out of the way, we can then focus on other matters. Except that is then a barrier that will put you off starting at all. It's better to get a quick win under your belt to put yourself in the right state of mind. And that means starting with something easy. 2. Leave work incomplete. This might go against every natural inclination. But before you lock up the office tonight, start some work and leave it incomplete. Why? Because the human brain hates a lack of closure. This makes it much easier to pick up and go first thing tomorrow. 3. Visualize why. It's easy to find the things we need to do boring and uninspiring. Why? Because we only want the prize at the end. We don't want to do the work in between. The key is to tap into the enthusiasm you have for the destination and to use that to motivate you on your journey. Picture why you are doing this. Feel it emotionally, and then you will be driven. 4. Rest. If you want to be as effective as possible during working hours, you need to rest during your time off. Sustained attention requires a lot of energy, and that runs out after a while. Give yourself some time to recoup and to do the things you want to do. 5. Music on repeat. Listen to the same musical tracks on repeat on headphones. Eventually, the brain becomes desensitized to hearing the same track play over and over, and thus tunes out. This makes it effectively like more entertaining white noise. It's like sensory deprivation, meaning you have an entire sense less to distract you. How to Conquer Your Fears and Face Any Challenge Fear is one of the most terrible things, and there is a simple reason for that. That is because your fears limit what you feel you can accomplish. Your fears prevent you from doing the things you want to do. They make you second-guess yourself, and they prevent you from taking chances. That, in turn, means that fears put restrictions on you, and they go as far as to limit your freedom. So the question is, how can you destroy fear? and face whatever challenge you choose. This presentation will attempt to provide you with some answers. Be willing to fail. It is not a brave man or woman who believes they cannot fail. That is a foolish one. Rather, it is a brave person who knows they can fail, but is willing to live with that possibility. This is the central philosophy of Stoicism in a nutshell. The notion that you might fail but that that is okay. Once you accept this possibility and realize that you can and will survive, it liberates you to try new things and to deal with the consequences when they come. Love the challenge. Similarly, it also pays to revel in the challenge. You don't fail until you stop trying. In the meantime, everything else is just another challenge, another obstacle. Think how dull life would be if everything were easy. The reality is that our brains and our bodies are designed to grow. They love challenge because this stimulates that growth and gives us a chance to better ourselves. So when your boss is giving you a hard time, consider it a test of your resolve. When you are struggling with debt, think of it as a challenge to earn the money you need fast. Face your fears. Tim Ferriss describes a process that allows a person to come to terms with their fears and to face them. This is called fear setting, 
and it involves writing down all the things you are afraid of on a piece of paper, and then writing down how you deal with each scenario and what the worst outcome of each case would be. So, if you are afraid of changing jobs, then maybe your fear stems from the fact that you might not like the new job, or that you might not be able to do it. But how likely is that, really? You managed with the last one. You wouldn't have gotten the job if your employer didn't think you capable. And if that happened, wouldn't you just change jobs again? How to get more from life by changing your mindset. Most of us hold a huge selection of different limiting beliefs. These limiting beliefs pertain to who we are, to the amount of power and influence we have in our lives, and to the way we're supposed to act in the world. And without meaning to sound pro-conspiracy, a lot of this appears to be by design, a byproduct of the modern lifestyle that we have been born into. We grow up having certain beliefs about what is expected of us and who we are meant to be. And because we are never given an alternative view, we tend to just accept those views. For instance, you grow up believing that at the age of 18 or 21, you will finish your education and get a conventional job. You'll get married at 25 to 30, and you'll have 2.5 perfect kids. What you won't do is run away and join the circus, or decide to work online and to travel the world while you do, or to choose to delay having a family. We are taught to fear all kinds of things. We fear debt. We fear old age. We fear being alone. These fears keep us motivated. They keep us motivated to work those boring 9-to-5 jobs and not to leave work for something more fulfilling. We are taught to want things that we don't really need. How about a big house and a good title? So that you can impress other people. How about a widescreen TV and a huge amount of videos? Let's be honest. You can get all the entertainment you'll ever need from one old computer. And how much money do you really need to go traveling? Why does a title matter? Wouldn't it be more fulfilling to do a small job that you don't care about and to, meanwhile, chase after your dreams in your spare time? No answer is wrong. If you are happy with the conventional view of success, then that is fine. But the point is that you should expand your mind. You should open yourself to other possibilities, other routes, other ways to be happy. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear put you in a box or dictate what you're going to do with your life. And certainly, don't be dictated by the expectations of other people. You can do anything you want to do. The worst case scenario is not as bad as you think it is, and there is limitless possibility out there. How to project the impression you want to give. Have you ever heard someone describe you and felt that they've got you all wrong? Have you ever described yourself as always relaxed, only for your friend to protest, no, you are not? We all have an idea of who we are, and we all have an idea of how others see us. But very often, that impression is not accurate. We are simply too close to the situation and very often trying to craft ourselves an image actually blows up in our faces. This presentation will help you to start projecting the image that you really want to have. Show, don't tell. The first absolutely critical thing to learn is that you must show and not tell. That means that you can't tell people who you are, and in fact, you can't even tell them about all the cool things you've done, hoping that they'll see you in a certain way. 
all this does is to make you look desperate to please and impress. And desperate probably isn't the impression you're going for, am I right? The key is to be an interesting, complex, and multifaceted person, and then to simply let others discover that for themselves. The devil is in the details. The other crucial tip is not to try and fake it. We've all been there. We've all tried to project an impression of ourselves as being more aloof or cooler or more athletic or more stylish. Maybe you've changed your whole wardrobe or tried talking in a different voice, but people will be able to tell. Why? Because you'll miss the small details, the tiny factors that people will only pick up on unconsciously, but that will present an incomplete picture. And this brings us on to the last and most important point. Be genuine. The reality is that you will only ever impress others by being yourself. Now, if you're worried that you aren't a very impressive person, if you'd like to be more knowledgeable or more stylish, then the key is not to fake it, but to become it. If you are truly passionate about that change, then invest the time and effort and actually make it a part of who you are. But don't force things that don't come naturally to you. You don't have to be a certain way to impress others. You just have to be good at what you do. You just have to be the best version of you. Focus on that, develop yourself, and others will start to notice. How to stay calm in any situation. We all know people in our lives who are as cool as cucumbers. These are the people who never seem to get phased by anything. No matter how the world is crashing down around them, they know just what to say and do, and they act as a calming influence on everyone around them. Then there are the people who get into a flap, who panic, and who shout. Guess who is the more effective in a crisis? Guess who makes the better leader? Guess who people look up to more? So, staying calm in any situation is an incredibly useful skill to have. The question is how you go about overcoming the all-too-human urge to lose it. In this presentation, we'll go over some simple steps you can take to keep your cool. Breathe. The first thing you need to do is to breathe. Recognize that the reason you're panicking is that you have gone into fight or flight. This is your body's physiological response to trouble, and it causes your heart rate to become elevated, your breathing to accelerate, and your mind to race. Not helpful. If you breathe, though, then you can regain your composure and fix your parasympathetic tone. In plain English, you can trigger your rest and digest state, which is the polar opposite of fight or flight. To get into this zone, you're going to use something called belly breathing. Breathe by expanding your gut first, and that way you can fill your lungs more completely, starting at the bottom. Breathe in and out for a count of three on each. Take a step back. The next step is to try and get your head in the game by removing your emotional response. You might be scared, worried for a friend, or upset. None of these things will help. So instead, take a step back and try to imagine what someone who wasn't you would do in this situation. What would James Bond do? Assess the situation in a more removed manner, and you'll come up with a better solution. Assess what needs to be done. One of the reasons that many of us become frozen with fear is that we don't want to take responsibility and make matters worse rather than better. To avoid this, quickly identify the worst-case scenario and the best-case scenario. Accept the possibility of the worst-case scenario, but take the steps you need to take to work toward the latter. How to Tap into the Mindset of the Most Successful Business Leaders How do you become a highly successful business leader? You might think it's impossible, but if you run through your list of objections, then I bet that few of them hold water. You don't have the money? Weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth? Well, guess what? 
Neither were half of the biggest CEOs in Silicon Valley. Next. What about technical expertise? Maybe you think you need to know how to program, or you need to know how to build computers? Actually, that can all be outsourced. Even Steve Jobs used Steve Wozniak to handle the tech side of things. No, the only thing missing is their mindset. And if you're making excuses, then that's the first sign that you aren't in the right frame of mind. So what can you do about it? The first thing I want you to do is to take responsibility and to decide what you want. Where do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? What are you passionate about? It is now down to you to accomplish that and make it happen. No one is going to hand it to you on a plate. Something that Tim Ferriss says is that you should look at the two worst outcomes. What's the worst outcome of going after your dream job? And what's the worst outcome of not? The worst case scenario, if you set up your passionate business, is that it goes wrong. It crashes and burns and you lose money and perhaps a little bit of face. But if you don't go after it, the worst case scenario is that you stay stuck in the same job forever. You never challenge yourself, never stretch yourself, and never find out what you could have done with your life. At 60, you look back on your life and you feel regret, although it is never too late to start. So find your passion and go after that. And no, I'm not talking about a compromise. You want to be the next Bill Gates or the next David Beckham? Then do that. Don't work in a tech firm and don't become a soccer coach. Go for the gold, because it's only when you are working toward your passion and your true goal that your body, mind, and will will be in alignment. It's only then that you will come alive and enter a flow state, a state of mind where everything else seems to slip away and you can accomplish anything. How to Tap Into the Power of Your Emotions There are a number of science fiction tales that depict societies that have done away with emotion. These people have learned to completely eradicate their basal instincts and become creatures of pure logic. The idea? That doing away with emotion would make us more reasoned, more practical, and even morally superior. War would end. Suffering would be a thing of the past. All that good stuff. But you know what? Emotion isn't just some biological inconvenience. It is not an accident. Our emotion is there for a reason, and it has a number of critical roles. The key is simply being able to tap into that emotion and being able to choose which mental state we want to be in at any given time. Sure, emotion is a bad thing when it causes us to make silly mistakes, or when it causes us to be too depressed to get out of bed in the morning. But did you know that emotions can also give us subtle cues before our logical brain has a chance to react? For example, if you play the game higher or lower, purely following your emotion and instinct, then you will perform better and faster than if you try to calculate the odds, or if you just play it by random. And when you are angry or scared, did you know that you actually become stronger and faster? Adrenaline increases muscle fiber recruitment, which in simple terms means you tap into greater strength. All those emotions are there for a reason. Anger has a place. It gives you the courage to stand up for yourself. Fear has a place. It helps you avoid danger. The key to getting emotions under control and tapping into them as needed is to learn 
to focus. Focus on the things that bring you comfort or the things that work you up. Need to tap into some reserves of strength, some latent energy? Remind yourself why this really matters and then focus on that fact. Need to overcome your fear? Then focus on the comforting facts of the situation. Maybe the worst case scenario isn't so bad. Events do not determine how we feel. Our reaction to events do that. Our interpretation of events does that. Your job is to choose what you want to react to and how you want to react to it. Why the right mindset is the first step to accomplishing your goals. No matter what it is that you want to accomplish, the first thing you need to do is to adopt the right mindset. Everything that you are, everything you do, and all the world around you begins in your mind. If you change the way your mind works, then this will have a ripple effect in every facet of your life. When it comes to accomplishing your goals, the most important thing is that you have passion, dedication, drive, motivation, determination, vision. In fact, accomplishing goals is not hard. All you need to do is to identify what it is you want, come up with a strategy to get there, and then work tirelessly and unceasingly until you start to see the results you want. No, no, it really is that easy. Problem is, a lot of people get confused along the way. And it starts right at the beginning, with having the wrong goal. You see, all too many people will set out with a goal that they think they need to accomplish. They'll work to become the person their mom wanted them to be, or that society thinks they should be. They'll choose the goal they think is easy enough to accomplish, and realistic enough. Or they'll not be sure what they want at all. And when you do that, you will lose the ability to really go after what you want. This is the one factor that is critical in every single person who has ever been a huge success. They love what they do. They are passionate about it. They work on it in their spare time because it is what wakes them up in the morning, what drives them through the day. Do you think Einstein would have had as many breakthroughs as he did if physics was just his 9 to 5 and he hated it? Do you think that Elon Musk would be as successful as he is today if he had just worked for FedEx? If you want to become the best version of you, then you need to go after the thing that makes you truly come alive. And that in itself goes against a lot of what we're trained to believe. It takes a huge cognitive shift. But if you're going to accomplish everything you want to, then you need to change your mindset. Three ways to get your emotions under control. Do you rule your emotions, or do your emotions rule you? Many of us feel instinctively that our emotions come from the way we feel. You've had a hard day, and so now you are thinking bad thoughts. Those bad thoughts are then making you feel unhappy. But have you ever thought that the opposite might be true? That you might be having bad thoughts because you are in a bad mood? That maybe this is what made your day bad? Either way, being able to control your emotions is crucial if you want to be as effective as you can be, maintain the respect of others, and generally perform your very best. In this presentation, we'll look at three ways you can get your emotions under your control. 1. Consider your physiology. Many of us think that emotions come from our psychology. Very often, though, they can also come from our physiology. That is to say that our emotions are dictated by the things that are going on in our bodies. For instance, if you are in a bad mood, then it could be because you're low on blood sugar. Our bodies use high blood sugar as a signal to create feel-good hormones. When it drops, we produce cortisol, which makes us anxious and hangry. You might be tired, too. Or perhaps your emotions could be getting in the way. Either way, you need to consider the role of your physiology as well as the role of your mind. 2. Control your thoughts. That said, controlling your thoughts is also important. Techniques used in CBT, 
cognitive behavioral therapy, teach us to challenge negative thoughts and to even test our unhelpful beliefs. This means first identifying the things we think and the things that are causing our bad state of mind, and then asking whether those thoughts are true or useful. 3. Meditate. There are countless good reasons to meditate. One of the most important, though, is that meditation can improve your emotional control, your focus, and your discipline. This is literally a process that involves focusing your mind and avoiding distracting thoughts. And if you can do that, then you can avoid distracting emotions as well. In the short term, a bout of meditation is a great way to calm your racing mind. In the long term, it is a powerful tool for enhancing your emotional stability. 5. Surprising Ways the Mind Influences the Body, and Vice Versa It is a mistake to think of our mind and body as separate entities. The reality is that we are holistic machines, and that no aspect of our psychology, physiology, or biology can exist independently of the rest. Your mood is tied to your physiology, and your physiology is tied to your mood. This is part of what makes the mind so powerful. It controls not only our thoughts, but also our body. Here are some surprising examples. 1. Your mind can boost your immune system. If you are positive, jolly, and surrounded by people who love you, then you are actually more likely to overcome illnesses. It turns out that stress suppresses the immune system, whereas happiness hormones can reinforce it. 2. Stress changes your children. Stress changes your biology in many ways. It can even change the way that certain genes are expressed, and that means you can pass those changes on to your children. Surprisingly, if you are very stressed when you conceive, your children are actually less likely to be stressed in life. 3. You don't digest food properly. Stress causes a range of conditions, such as psoriasis, but did you know it also prevents you from properly digesting your food? This can actually lead to malnutrition, even if you are eating properly. 4. Your gut changes your mood. So, your mood changes the way your gut behaves. But did you know that this relationship is a two-way street? You see, your gut contains nearly as many neurons as your brain, and the tiny bacteria that live there actually produce neurotransmitters that can affect your mood. This is why the gut is sometimes referred to as the second brain. 5. Embodied Cognition Embodied cognition is a recent theory in psychology that better explains the close link between the body and the brain. Previously, it was thought that the brain had its own internal language. This was sometimes referred to as mentalese. The idea was that whenever someone said something to you, your brain would translate that into mentalese so that you could understand it. But now it is thought that the way the brain understands things is by visualizing those things. And that happens by lighting up areas in the brain as though you were doing those things. So if I told you about a walk I took through the woods, you might visualize yourself walking through the woods. Perhaps feel the wind on your neck and the leaves crunching underfoot. The brain doesn't work without the body, and vice versa.